Let's have a look at the rate at which a radioactive sample decays. And this has everything to do with what's called the half-life. So if we have a radioactive nuclei, it might decay at any time. It's totally random when it decays. However, if we have a very large sample with billions and billions of radioactive nuclei, we have something called a half-life, which is very well defined and, in fact, very precise. If you have a very large sample, exactly half of those radioactive nuclei will decay in one half-life. Let's see that with a little simulation by Walter Fent. So what you're seeing below is a thousand undecayed radioactive nucleides. And when I press the start button, they begin to decay. And it's quite random when they decay. I've let the time run for 0.13 t, and t is supposed to be the half-life. In this case, it's about 20 seconds. So I've let it run for a little over one second. And during that time, there's still 911 nuclei that have not decayed, and there's 89 nuclei that have decayed. Now, if I let this run, and I'm going to run, let it run for about 20 seconds, or one full half-life, and I'll try to pause it just at the right time. Okay, now you can see that the number that have not de yet decayed is 527. The number that have decayed is 473, which means it's roughly a 50-50 split. Now, if we had a lot more particles, we would be much closer to a 50-50 split. So now I have 527 nuclei that have not decayed. If I run it for another half-life, I should get half as many ag again. So I should be down to somewhere around 250. Let's see what happens. Okay, I stopped it just short at 1.99 t, or nearly two half-lives. And you'll see here, I've got 253 nuclei that have not yet decayed. So that 500 that I have before, half of those have decayed again. And this process would continue. If I go up to three half-lives, I'd get half of 250. If I go up to four half-lives, I'd get half of half of 250, etc. Now, if you understood that, this will be a good... IB question for you. So what I'd like you to do is read over the question, try it out, and then come back for the answer. And the correct answer is 50%. So what's kind of strange here is if something has a half-life of five minutes, we can start that five minutes at any time. There's always a 50% chance of it decaying within five minutes, even if five minutes has already passed. And maybe we can see that a little more clearly with the decay curve shown below. So on the decay curve, you either plot the number of radioactive particles, n, or you could also plot uh, the mass of those par particles, because mass and number of particles are proportional to each other. There's also something called the activity that you could plot against the half-life, and the curve would have the same shape. The activity is simply the number of decays per second. Of course, you get more decays if you have more particles, and that means the activity and the number of particles are proportional. In other words, these three quantities are all proportional to one another, and therefore their curves would all have the same shape. Okay, so this particular one is a, you're looking at mass versus the time in years. 1620 here, that's the half-life. So this would be t, the half-life. This would be 2t, and this would be 3t. We start out with 1 kilogram of mass, and then after one half-life, we have half a kilogram. Now, if we let the clock roll for another half-life more, we're going to get a quarter of a kilogram. And then if we let the time run for another full half-life, we're going to get one-eighth the number or mass of radioactive nucleides. Notice that there isn't any mass suddenly disappearing or anything. This is just a different type of non-radioactive nucleide represented by the white part of the box. Now, if I want to focus in, say, on one particular atom, let's say I pick out this atom right here. Okay, So it has not decayed for two half-lives. But the probability of it decaying in the next half-life is still 50%. It's still 50% of these nucleides that decay in the following half-life. Okay, I have a numerical example for you. What I'd like you to do is to pause the video, read over the question, try it yourself, and then come back for the answer. Okay, so we're starting out with some 2,000 nucleides, radioactive nucleides. That's 
after zero half-lives, which is, of course, zero time. Now, if we move on and advance by one half-life, which is supposed to be three hours, then we should get half as many particles, which would be a thousand particles. Now, if we go to two half-lives, which, of course, would be six days of time, then we would be down to half again, or 500 particles, and then we would need one more half-life, which would be nine years, in order to get all the way down to 250 radioactive nucleides. So the correct answer here should be nine days. You might very well see right away that we could model this behavior with an equation. We had started off with 2,000 particles, and then we multiplied it by a half, after one half-life, and then we did it again after two half-lives, and again after three half-lives. In other words, we've really got an equation there, 2,000 times one-half raised to the number of half-lives. So as a more general equation, we could say that the number of particles will equal the number of particles that you start with, the initial number of particles, times one-half raised to n, the number of half-lives. Of course, the number of half-lives would just be given by the amount of time you're talking about divided by the time for one half-life. So now we've got a formula that will model radioactive decay. And as I was saying before with the graph, the number of particles has to be proportional to the mass. If you've got more particles, you got proportionally more mass. But now we want to introduce a new quantity called the activity which will simply equal the rate of decay. It's the number of decays per unit time. Well, if you've got 10 particles, there's 10 times the likelihood of decay as there are for one particle. In other words, activity is always proportional to the number of particles as well. Which means we had this equation for n, but we could write the same equation for a and for m as well. We could write that the mass at any given time will equal the initial mass times one-half raised to the number of half-lives. Or we could say the activity was equal to the initial activity, the initial number of decays per second, times one-half raised to the number of half-lives, where, of course, n is simply the number of half-lives within the time that you've allowed to pass. Okay, another example. What I'd like you to do is to read over the question, try it out, and then come back for the answer. Now, you might see right away that uh, 2 cubed is equal to 8. And therefore, if we want to get 1 eighth the mass, or 1 eighth the number, or 1 eighth the activity, that means we have to wait for three half-lives. So we could also do this as an equation. I want to get, I want to make sure that n divided by n0 is equal to 1 eighth, which is equal to 1 half to the n. So then you'd say that 8 equals 2 to the n, and n equals 3. Because of proportionality between n and m and a, we can equally write that n over n0 equals a over a0 equals m over m0, and all will have to have the same answer. Okay, another question what I'd like you to do is pause the video, try the question, and then come back for the answer. Okay, so this question, it's given in terms of the mass, so we'll write our equation in terms of mass. And I'll write the n as the time divided by the half-life. So for an initial amount was 8 grams, we've got a 1 half, the half-life was 12, and we were running this for 36 days, that means we're going through three half-lives, that means we've got 8 times 1 half cubed, which means 8 times 1 eighth, which will be 1 gram. Or you could have just done this in your head and said, okay, well, after 1 half, one half life, we'll be down to 4 grams, after 2 half-lives, we'll half that again down to 2 grams, and then after 3 half-lives, we'll be down to 1 gram. Another question, read it over, try it out, and then come back for the answer. The number of half-lives will be the time, which is 4 minutes, divided by the half-life, which is 2 minutes. So you're going through 2 half-lives, which means that you should be down to 1 half 
squared or one quarter as much mass of the radioactive nucleide. And so the radioactive nucleide was the oxygen uh, 15 here and it should be down to 25 percent of what it was. Now the other 75 grams they changed into nitrogen and that means we should get 75 grams of nitrogen. And so the correct answer here should be D. And another question, I read it over, try it out, and then come back for the answer. Okay, so in this one, of course, the activity is proportional to the number of particles. So if we wait 10,000 years, which is two half-lives, we should have one quarter the activity. And so our best answer here is A, less than half the original activity. And another question, read it over, try it out, and then come back for the answer. So in this one here, you're kind of working backwards. Uh, you're given a present activity. So we can say that A equals A0, one-half to the N. But in this case here, our present activity is 1,000. When was the activity 8,000? Which means that one-eighth must be equal to equal one-half to the N. And that means N must equal 3. And as our half-life was six hours, then our total time will be three times six hours, or 18 hours. And so the correct answer is D. Now you might have done this in your head. If right now you've got a thousand particles, then one half-life ago you'd have two thousand, two half-lives ago you'd have four thousand, and three half-lives ago you'd have eight thousand. Therefore you can say that N equals three, and then three, times six hours would give you 18 hours. And one more question, I'll read it over, try it out, and then come back for the answer. Okay, and this is a very important point here, that there's nothing that you can do to change the rate of nuclear decay. That the, really, the nuclear energies are so, are so large compared to, say, atomic energies or heat energies, that the rate of nuclear decay is not at all affected by surrounding chemical changes and heat changes, etc. So this is an important point. You can't alter the half-life of a sample just by putting it in a stove or something like that. And that's all for today, folks. Thank you very much.